Amen. Thank you so much. I invite you to take your copy of the Word of God and turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. We're going to start a new chapter. How about that? Uh, verse number 1 through 4. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received just penalty, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was also confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testified with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. When I was growing up, we had these amazing inventions in our homes that hung on the walls and sat on kitchen counters. They were called telephones, and they looked like that. You remember those, anybody? Yeah, the old people are like, uh-huh. And the other people are like, what is that? It's going back in time. Often there was a telephone book sitting there with it. And that had the names of and phone numbers of every person in the community. You had access to everybody's phone number. And you could call anybody in the community, and they could call you anytime they wanted. Crazy. Why would we do that? I don't know. We, uh, we had a telephone, but uh, there wasn't, people always, not everybody had telephones. When we lived in the trailer court, some people didn't even have telephones, and they would come over and knock on the door and say, uh, can uh, we use your phone to make a call? Can you imagine living in a time when you didn't have a telephone? And some of you are like, telephones? We didn't have indoor plumbing. What are you talking about, right? You know, we, we, can, go back, we can go back there. Some people are waving at me right now. Don't look around. We don't know, date ourselves too bad. But yeah, that, that, was, a, that was a time like that. But man, I, I, I always was happy we had a phone. My dad... Um, he went down into the basement and he spliced a bunch of lines into the t telephone line and ran them all up to our rooms and put in jacks. So we had telephones in all of our bedrooms, which was really great because until he did that, you had to stand in the hall, right, and try to talk. And that's hard to talk to girls when you're standing in the hall, you know, it's kind of tacky. And but when he put it in the bedroom, we all could have privacy in our rooms. And I, I remember, I couldn't imagine not having a phone. In 1989, when I was uh, in high school, I couldn't imagine not having a phone. And I still remember, uh, who else can do this? I can still remember my childhood phone number, right? So I mean, like 506-375-4918, memorized. And, uh, you know, call that and see who you get. I don't know. That was my parents' number for 30 years. I don't think, you know it, if it is or not anymore, it could be. But I would never call my dad on the landline. People rarely use those kinds of phones anymore. Now we have smartphones. Well, isn't that just the telephone? Well, it is, but it's so much more. It is so much better. I thought this picture was funny because it illustrates all the things we used to buy that we don't have to buy anymore because it's all right in here. You don't buy music players or cameras, video cameras, Calculators, flashlights, video games, Rolodex, day planner, watch, alarm clock, and a telephone all in one. That's so much better than that old phone. I don't even have a landline in my house. I haven't had one since 2006. And never once has anyone in the family said, you know, Dad, what would really be helpful? <clears throat> if we would put a landline in. Nobody wants to go back to the, the old rotary days. So uh, Hebrews chapter 2, uh, a brief summary of Hebrews chapter 1 so that we can understand the context of what we're going to study today in Hebrews chapter 2. But in Hebrews chapter 1, we've already done this, just reviewing briefly, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son. So the point of my little opening illustration was, verse 1, the prophets, rotary phone. In these last days, Jesus, smartphone. So much more. And the things that we learned about him, the heir of all things, 
He made the world. He is the radiance of the glory and the exact representation of the nature of God, upholding all things by the word of his power, made purifications from sin, and sits down at the right hand of majesty on high. All these things wrapped up in one person, Jesus Christ. The prophets used to bring us the word. Jesus is the word. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Verse number four, he said, having becoming much better than angels as he inherited a more excellent name than they. Think about that for a moment. The Greek word angelos, angel, I told you literally means messenger. God used to send his messages through the angel messengers. And they were often the ones who told the prophets what they should say to the nations. That's what their name need. But Jesus has a more excellent name than they. Question, what does Jesus, Yeshua, mean? God saves. Yahweh saves. And what does Yahweh mean? The Hebrew word means I am. So Jesus' name literally means I am salvation. That is a more excellent name than messenger. He is the message. The angels were the messengers. Jesus is the message. He is the word. He is God. That's what the author of Hebrews is presenting to the audience. But it's not a different message or something opposite to what God had already said. No, the author uses the messages from the prophets to prove his point. So in chapter one, he gave several quotes that were all Old Testament messianic prophecies. In chapter one, verse number five, he starts off by quoting Psalms two, verse seven. I will announce the decree of the Lord. He said, you are my son. Today I have fathered you. And again, he quotes Psalm uh, first, second Samuel chapter seven. I will be a father to him. He will be a son to me. When he does wrong, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the strokes of the man, son of mankind. So two Old Testament messianic quotes into this one verse. Verse 6, same thing, Psalms 97. May all those who be ashamed, who serve carved images, who boast in idols, let him, uh, worship him, all you gods. And then we talked about the, the spiritual beings, the entities last week, the angels, the lowercase gods. Let them worship the sun. In verse number 8 and 9, he's quoting Psalms 45. Your throne, O God, is forever your scepter of your kingdom is a scepter your the scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of justice you have loved righteousness hated wickedness therefore god your god has anointed you with the oil of joy above your companions verses 10 and 11 of chapter 1 is quoting psalms 102 in time of old you founded the earth the heavens are the works of your hand, even when they perish, you endure. All of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change and they will pass away. But you are the same and your years will not come to the end. Talking about Jesus, the Messiah. And then lastly, verse 13, he was quoting Psalms 110. The Lord sends to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make the enemies the footstool of your feet. And Jesus Christ was exalted to the right hand of God the Father. The audience understood these passages here, these Old Testament passages. They understood they were messianic prophecies. And for them, it was theory. It was academic. Something people would say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know about the Messiah. And then they would quote the prophetic messianic passages. But then Jesus comes along and it's no longer theory. It's no longer prophecy. It's now reality. He, we learned the exact truth of who Jesus was when we studied the book of Luke. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. It all came to pass. All those prophecies were fulfilled in him. Now we go to chapter two. The author says, for this reason, for the reason stated in chapter one, for the reason that Jesus is the son of God, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. A couple of Greek words for you. 
perisoteros, more in a greater degree above others, much closer is what it means. Attention, the Greek word is pros echo, to be attentive, to be devoted in thought and effort. And then the Greek word for drift, para raeo, to glide by, to pass away, to slip away. So one of the cool features of our smartphones is that you can schedule all your events in your day timer and set an alarm to go off and remind you. And this really works well because you generally have it in your hand, right? You're usually sitting there looking at social media to see if anybody likes you, right? Or you're playing solitaire to entertain yourself and all of a sudden, oh, oh, reminder. Oh, I'm supposed to be doing something. And uh, thank you, smartphone, for being so smart and remembering things that I do not remember. But the thing with that feature is, in order for it to work, you actually got to load your schedule into the calendar and you got to set your alarm. And of course, my well-organized wife does this. But the rest of the guys in the family, eh, maybe we're not quite so diligent. And then we forget things. Uh, an event, para raeo, it slips our mind. And we're like, ah, oh, I forgot about that. And she says, did you load it in your phone? If you would have, you wouldn't have forgotten. And at that point, all you can do is just take the corrective criticism because... She's right. Something you got to learn, Jonathan. Just take the corrective criticism. You know, something, Zach, we worked on that in counseling. Take the corrective criticism. Just say, yes, dear, you're right. And uh, that will help smooth things over. Uh, and, uh, you know, I forget. I don't prioritize. I, uh, and it, then the event slips my mind. Now, sometimes things slip by and you just shrug your shoulders and say, uh, you know, oh, that NBA finals was this week. Ah, I forgot about that. Uh, no big deal. But then other things slip your mind. Oh, you know, yesterday was my anniversary. Yeah, oh, well, no, no, that is not an oh, well, that's something you're supposed to pay much more attention to. Now, that, that fortunately, my anniversary is August 20th. So uh, one year I've told the story before, but lots of new people here. One year on our anniversary uh, that week, I was I was telling Ileana something that was happening uh, I was probably going to do on that day, probably play basketball on Saturday. And I was like, yeah, I'm probably going to do that. And she said, you got, you got nothing else going on? That, that day's all clear? And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. And she's like, oh, okay. Go ahead. I'm like, ugh. Because that's how we are, right? Ugh. So uh, I'm talking to my dad, eh? And, uh, and he says, oh, by the way, Happy anniversary. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, but anniversary. Oh, so later on that day, I'm talking to Eliana and I said, yeah, I, I, I don't think I'm going to play basketball Saturday. She said, what? Why not? I said, well, it's our anniversary. <laughs> did, did you forget? And she said, who told you? Who reminded you? And I was like, what, what are you talking about? I could never forget such an important occasion. It's like, no, no, you forgot. Who told you? I was like, uh, Bob did. He's like, darn it, Bob. Oh, you're so lucky. I was going to make you pay. So happy Father's Day, Bob. I owe you one, eh? Thanks, bud. My father, like my wife, pays good attention to details. So um, I'm not so good at that. But smartphones can help. But so also can other people who love us and will remind us of things. And this is what the author is doing. This is who he is, someone who's himself is paying close attention and then he loves these people and he's reminding them and so all of us in here we all have someone we love dearly that we would never want to see get hurt we would never want to see them slip away from the faith we have to be looking out for others who may be prone to inattentiveness and remind them about Jesus the author is being an accountability partner so question 
Who in your life is allowed to call you and challenge you? Hey, bud, what are we doing here? I think you're forgetting what the word says about this. You seem to be slipping. You seem to be drifting away in your faithfulness. Who's allowed to do that to you? Well, my dad, on top of reminding me about my anniversary, he's always been there for me and my wife as well. She gives me that corrective criticism. But there's a lot of people in my life who can speak honesty and speak truth and give me an honest correction. Kind of humbling. I don't always want to hear when I'm messing up. And yet, some things you just can't afford to let slip by. The things that the Son of God has revealed to us, these things we must not let slip by. These are the things that we must not drift away from, the author says. Because if the word was spoken, verse 2, through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received just penalty, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So he says here, the, the word spoken by the angels. So the, the, the word in the Greek is logos, and it means message. It's the same word that is used in John chapter 1, verse number 1. In the beginning was the logos, the word. And the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. If the word spoken by the angels proved unalterable and every transgression and just disobedience received just penalty. When did that happen? Is that true? Well, a couple of examples of that. The angels brought the message of destruction concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. That came true. The death angel went through the land of Egypt and killed the firstborn and all of the families. That came true. We talked about last week how one angel killed 185,000 Assyrian troops. The angel brought the message to da Daniel, spelling out the rise and fall of the world empires. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, all of that which was spoken took place in history exactly as the angel of the Lord foretold to Daniel. I cannot stress that point enough to you, Faith Bible Church. The fulfillment of predictive prophecies is the smoking gun evidence that God has given to us to bolster our faith and to prove to all the naysayers what we believe is true. History bears record that the Bible is telling the truth. It predicted the rise and the fall of all of those ancient empires, even naming Cyrus, the Persian king, hundreds of years before he came onto the scene, named his name in the book of Isaiah. These things have happened, but you're not going to learn about that in your high school history class, now are you? No, of course not. You're not even going to get accurate American history in your public school system. You won't learn about biblical history these days. You won't even learn that in the theological schools in this nation. They have been totally corrupted by liberalism and false teachers who only believe in the interpretations of people that reject the authority of God's word, reject the inerrancy, the infallibility of scripture. They reject the supernatural and thus all they teach is how to contradict and dismiss the word of God. And then you wonder why churches are ordaining lesbians. Well, that's how we got there. It started in 1929. I'd like to do this history lesson for everybody. When Princeton University, the theological school for the Presbyterian denomination, started, decided that they would no longer teach the Bible as being the infallible word of God. Eh, it's not really God's word. It's just some people, some dudes wrote that. Yeah, well, the predictive prophecies that come true time and time again keep proving otherwise. You know what wasn't around in 1929 when Princeton decided not to believe the word of God was literal? The nation of Israel. You know what became a nation in one day, just like the prophet Isaiah foretold in 1949? The nation of Israel. Well, maybe it might be a good time for Princeton University to revisit their hermeneutics. So, oh, you know, we ought maybe to start taking the word of God literally. After all, it keeps coming true in front of our very eyes. But 
you'd have to be paying much closer attention to know these things. You need to be in a church where the teachers and the preachers are rightly dividing the word of truth. Not social gospel, not prosperity gospel, not denominationalism, not the latest self-help book from the hottest new author. What four-part topical series are we going to do this month? Hmm. I invite you to take your copy of the Word of God this morning and turn to Hebrews chapter 2 and join us as we embark on a two to three, four year study, verse by verse, through the entire book. How else do you pay much closer attention? We have to actually read it in order to make literal observations so that we can make accurate interpretations and then we can make relevant applications. If the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, what the angels said was unalterable, the transgressions and the disobedience received a just penalty, yes, that happened. The message of the angels came true. So if their words are unalterable, how much more unalterable will be the words of Jesus, the Son of God, whose name is greater than the angels. The angels brought the word of God. Jesus is the living word. The angels gave the prophecies. Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies. Jesus' name literally is, I am salvation. Verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? If you drift away from the words of Jesus, if you let his teachings slip out of your mind, if you don't hold fast to the faith, how can you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? After all, it was first spoken through the Lord and confirmed to us by those who heard it. The gospel was spoken through the Lord it was confirmed by all the disciples, the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, recorded the exact truth of who Jesus is and what he said. God also testified with them. God in heaven testified. When what? Both signs and wonders and various miracles. Jesus did miracles. The disciples did miracles. And then... The Holy Spirit, according to his own will, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit poured out upon us. What does that mean? And this is now where I could break off and do a 10-part sermon series, unpacking the third part of the Trinity and explaining all the works of the Holy Spirit. Really don't want to do that, so let's just summarize it briefly. Jesus broke the news to his disciples. He said, I'm going away. I go to prepare a place for you. If I have not so, I wouldn't have told you. And if I go, I will come again. And so they're kind of worked up about this because Jesus is their king. He's their Messiah. Where is he going? What are we supposed to do? But he promised them, I won't leave you as orphans in the world. I will send another, a comforter. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and then you will be my witnesses, he said. And sure enough, at the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples. And then we learn through the the letters, Paul, the Apostle Paul teaches us that the Holy Spirit regenerates and renews the believer, Titus chapter 3. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds that, which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Believers receive a new birth by the power of the Holy Spirit. If any man be in Christ, he is born again. He is a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. That is the imagery of baptism. Old things pass away. All things become new. You are born again. This is what this act is symbolizing in acting out for people. This, and we got four young fellows that are going to take this act today. They're going to be a sermon illustration here in just a few minutes. The, uh, the Spirit in His mighty power fills believers with all joy and peace so that they can trust in the Lord, causing us to overflow with hope, Paul says. Sanctification, that's another work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. The Spirit sets itself against the desires of the flesh and leads the believer into righteousness. Turn to Galatians briefly. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 Paul instructs us, Galatians 5, 16, 
I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and Spirit against the flesh, for these are in the opposition to one another, so you may not do the things that you please. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh, here's how you walk by the flesh. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's walking by the flesh. But walking by the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, here's what should be coming out of you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. For those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. They've died to the old self, as the baptism shows us. And they've crucified their passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. The works of the flesh become less evident in the believer. And the fruit of the Spirit becomes more evident. And we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit and yielded to His control in our lives. And then we also learn that not just the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit also gives us gifts. He gives us powers. Things that we are blessed and gifted to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 goes into that. And uh, take the one, 301 class if you want an in-depth study on the gifts of the Spirit. And you can learn what your gifts are and maybe what you could be using and doing to serve the Lord. The Holy Spirit also does work for unbelievers. Not only just works in believers, he, he works in unbelievers too. He, Jesus promised he would send the Holy Spirit to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgments. The Spirit testifies of Christ, pointing people to the Lord. Currently, the Holy Spirit is also restraining sin and combating the secret powers of lawlessness in the world. The, this action of, of pushing back and restraining is what's keeping the rise of the Antichrist, which we know is going to come one day. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, when the restrainer is removed, then the lawless one comes. And we believe the restrainer is the Holy Spirit and in the church, in us. That's, the, that's one of those pre-trib evidences that I, I pose to people when they ask me about that. It says Paul says that the, the Antichrist doesn't come until the restrainer is removed. If the restrainer is the Holy Spirit and Jesus promised the believer that I won't leave you as orphans in the world and you'll receive the Spirit, if the Spirit's going, guess where we're going to, right? So that's the way I parse that out. So he's holding that all back. And then the Holy Spirit also is giving us wisdom to understand God. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Spirit searches everything, the deep things of God. And he makes this little thing. He says, who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him. So no one can comprehend the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So the spirit of God helps speak to you and helps you understand the mind of Christ. Since we've been given this amazing gift of the Holy Spirit, we can comprehend the thoughts of God. So the author of Hebrews just affirmed that the three parts of the Trinity endorse this gospel message. God the Son spoke it first to the disciples. God the Father testified through the signs and the wonders. And God the Holy Spirit gives the gifts. All three parts of the Godhead support this great salvation message. So now the question I pose to you once again, how shall we escape if we neglect, if we slipped, if we drift away from so great a salvation? And the answer is, we will not. We will not escape. Escape from what? We need to be saved from what? Well, first off, we need to be saved from ourselves. I figured that out when I was 21 years old, that I was my own worst enemy, that I was sabotaging my life. Can you be honest enough to admit when you're making a mess, when your bad choices are causing yourself and other people pain, shame, offense? People don't like to hear that, do they? 
They like to be affirmed and, and never told they've ever done anything wrong and, and that, that they never do anything embarrassing and they're never offensive. We just, you know, we just want to love people and we don't want to be judgmental. Yes, but people are destroying themselves. Their lifestyles are leading them to poverty and shame, to bad mental and even physical health. If you pay close attention to the word of God, it lays out principles that will help you. John Her financially, right? We teach a class on that. It will help you with your health. It teaches principles that will help you with your personal relationships, husbands, wives, children, people in your community, how to love people. It teaches us about that. It will help you with your relationship with God and maybe even help you birth a ministry so that you could help other people. You learn it and then you can help other people. It's all here. If you learn these things and you practice these things, you will be blessed and you will have a blessed life. But if you violate them, Proverbs chapter 13 says, poverty and shame comes to the one who neglects discipline. But the one who complies with rebuke will be honored. Desire realized is sweet to the soul. But it's an abomination of fools who turn away to turn away from evil. Fools just don't like to turn away from evil. So you first need to be saved from yourself. And then you need to be saved from the world around us. First John chapter 2 verse 17. The world's passing away and the lust thereof. But the one who desires the will of God, the one who does, does the will of God, will live forever. We live in a very corrupt, evil world. And many people will do you dirty, won't they? And you turn to Psalms chapter 3 for a moment. The psalmist kind of lays this out for us. <clears throat> he says, Psalms chapter 3 verse 1, Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying on my soul, there's no deliverance for him in God. So they're mocking the author and they're mocking God. God can't save him. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I, I lay down and slept. I awoke, and the Lord sustained me. I will not fear 10,000 men who will set themselves against me round about. Arise, O oh Lord, and say me, O oh my God, you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessings be upon your people. We become so much more aware of this once we become parents and we see all the danger and all the corrupt people who want to use and abuse our children. And the psalmist calls out to God to save him from his enemies. So we need to be saved from ourselves. We need to be saved from all this stuff out in the world. But you know, the biggest danger that you need to be saved from is the wrath of God. John chapter 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And, and Paul writes, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against un, all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The greatest danger the average person faces, you know not when you will die. And it can happen at any time. We had a prayer request here earlier this morning of a 15-year-old who died on, on, up here on the highway, right? I always, you know, am mindful of the fact, everybody, please be careful when you leave. Drive safely, right? Just because 235, I've sat here one day and watched three accidents in one week right there, right? Just any time. You don't know when you're going to die. And then once you do, the Bible says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, you stand before God in judgment. Now, most people understand they're going to die someday, uh, sometime, I guess. But what they're ignoring, what they're not paying attention to, is God has told us exactly what happens when we die. We are all guilty sinners. Right now in the world, all have sins. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We are all disobedient, and if we die in that state, the judgment that we will receive when we stand before God is guilty. God is holy. 
And he cannot allow sin to abide in his presence. He cannot allow sinful people to enter into his heaven. And if you cannot enter into heaven, the only place left for you to go is? Only two people know that place. Let's say that again. If you can't get that, if you can't go abide in heaven, the only place left is hell. We got to say that. And that's where all those who violate God's commands will end up. But the good news is, Romans chapter 5, God shows his love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we are now justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him. What are we saved from? The wrath of God. God so loved us that Jesus, the sinless son of God, came to earth, died in our, on our behalf, died in our place, paid the penalty, paid the death penalty for our sins. Paul says the wages of sin, what you earn for your sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the great salvation that Jesus is offering us. This is the message that God is giving Jesus is our salvation. Believe who he said he is. Believe that he died and that he rose again. Believe his promise. If you will confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will forgive you and he will save you from the wrath of God. One year, my cousin took Ricky and Tony with them on vacation. The boys are, I think, like 12 and 10 on this trip, something like that. The place they stayed had a canoe. So the kids were playing in the water and they were using the canoe. And when they were all done, they pulled it up on the shore and they went inside for the night. However, during the evening, the tide rose, lifted up the canoe, and it drifted away. And the next day when they went out to use the canoe, it was nowheres to be found. And they ran around. Hey, you seen a canoe? Seen a canoe? And they couldn't find the canoe. So my cousin had to replace that canoe. That was an extra vacation expense she was not expecting. Incidentally, she never took the kids with her again. <laughs> but she had to be responsible because at the end of the day, the kids were being kids and they did not think about tides and they were not paying close attention to the details. So the canoe drifted away and the inattentiveness was costly. And right now, today, there might be someone sitting here and your life is like that canoe. Time is drifting away. Your life is drifting away. And because you're not paying close attention, you're losing it. And your negligence is costing you. Because one day there will be no time left. It will all be gone. And if you've neglected Jesus, if you neglected this time that you have to obey him and serve him and trust him, how will you escape? And the answer is, you will not escape. Jesus, Yeshua, I am salvation. Jesus is our salvation. Do not neglect him. I wonder if anybody needs to ask Jesus even today. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Band's going to come up here in a moment, play a song. Young fellows are going to go get changed for the baptism. But if you right now or you're here today and you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, if you've never said, dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I believe you are the son of God. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose again. Thank you for doing that. Please forgive me. That's what he says he'll do. That is the salvation. That is the gift of God. Jesus will forgive you. He died for you. And when you die and you stand before God, you won't be standing alone. Jesus will be standing right there beside you as an advocate to say, this is my child. They believed in me. That's what we all need to hear. When we stand at that judgment seat, we got to have Jesus there with us. Nobody else can stand there for you. You can't get a lawyer at that point. You can't give money. You can't buy your way out. Isn't that a great thing to know? Isn't that a great thing to know that there is going to be justice and nobody can buy their way out, but everyone has to follow the rules. But Jesus is the only way. I would pray, Lord Jesus, that someone here today would pray that prayer and believe in you and 
and that we all would just continue to grow closer and deeper in our knowledge, that we would not neglect this great salvation, and we will not neglect the people around us who need to hear of this great salvation. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.